Good morning. Welcome to the second day of developing heritage and nature tourism in the Humber Head Levels and the Ancombe Valley. The first of the day two themes is developing tourism and leisure opportunities and case studies. And we're going to look at part one, which is the Humber Head Levels. This gives an impression of both the current problems that the region faces and a hint of why we have these huge, huge issues. This was largely a former vast, intractable wetland, a fenland and a peatland with massive raised bogs extensive wet woodland, willow and alder car, and slow, sluggish, meandering, multi-channeled rivers. It's now transformed into a mix of intensive arable farming, of increasing business and industrial usage, and urban residential usage, over which is laid extensive um, transport infrastructure of various sorts. <clears throat> and combined with the topography and the history of drainage and agricultural intensification, along with the current challenges of climate change, this really is a major, major challenge. So we have some big issues. And developing tourism and tour tourism and leisure infrastructure can be part of the solution. It can be a positive way uh, to get out of a, a mess that we're in. This is Arxi back in 2012. And the point is that before drainage, the great drainage, as I call it, the Humber levels was around 36,000 hectares, so about 75,000 acres, which was described in the 1600s as a continual lake and a rendezvous of ye waters of ye rivers. In winter, it was a vast inland sea, about 500 square miles of wetland. Even captured on this amazing early map, one of the earliest English maps of the Great Inkles Moor, with the Humber estuary, the rivers coming into it, and this vast, vast peat bog. And this is a map to record the monastic turberies, the areas where people had the right or potential or could pay money for commercial extraction of peat turf. And the vast peat bogs of Thorn and Hatfield even supplied peat for peat fuel to medieval York, carried by barge along the watercourses. Wow, what a map. I've long had an idea of a vision called Wilder Visions for this vast wetland. The idea is based on the uh, Lawton uh, image of bigger, bolder, better, and more joined. And where better to test that than the Humber Levels with its great arterial rivers, the Don, the Ouse, the Derwent, the Trent, the Air, the Calder, the Torn, the Idle, etc. So we have this vision of a, a wetter, wilder, more vibrant future for the Humber Levels. It's going to be wetter. It's going to be wilder in the future because of climate change. And there's nothing we can do to uh, avert that. So we need to think about being more adaptable, more resilient, and actually, if you pardon the pun, going with the flow. And a rich farming landscape, which is accessible, climate friendly, biodiverse, 
and resilient. So our vision still incorporates um, an agricultural future, but one where some of the crops will by necessity because of issues of water and issues of climate and land use, they will be different. And again, we have the irony that from a meteorological point of view, i.e. weather, the Humber Levels is a dry region. So for an intensive arable farming, you need two things. You need to get water off by drainage. You also need to get water on by irrigation. And there may not be available water to do the latter. We ran and were part of a countryside agency project back in the 1990s and the early 2000s. It's called Value in Wetness. And this showed that there were significant ecological and heritage assets across the Humberhead levels. And the present day Humberhead partnership derives from the, the closing stages of that long term project. And my role and responsibility in that was looking at leisure and tourism and access. However, despite these assets, it was identified as a seriously underperforming tourism economy. There's a lack of coordination and marketing, a lack of key infrastructure. For tourism, you have to have places to stay, places to go, places to shop, places to eat. There was very limited facility and what there was was not coordinated. So absence of key strategic tourism infrastructure. In particular, we identify the issue of a lack of accommodation across the levels. There was nowhere that you could stay. And it's very hard for farmers or others who are trying to develop accommodation facilities to navigate the um, quite difficult and problematic planning procedures. If we're going to develop leisure and tourism in a more significant way, we need to have opportunities to spend, opportunities to stay. You can have very nice nature reserves and green, I hate the term, but green infrastructure, green places, green countryside for people to visit, but most of it is, is free. There's no, there's no spend. And what the public wants are opportunities to spend they want you know if you think about what is required for a countryside day visit for example then you're looking at a car park toilets information networks access shops cafes restaurants somewhere to stay we need to think about developing tourism impacts encouraging visitors and consequent spending and importantly, diversifying the tourism appeal. So nature, heritage, sport, leisure, business, etc. These are all part of the opportunity which is out there waiting to be tapped. And then if you've got visitors, you need to think about retaining visitor spend and growing local impacts. Even if your organization's role is not primarily social change or economic improvement, the fact that you're actually doing this anyway, you're spending money, you're employing people, you need ethically, morally to increase the maximum impact, get more bang for your buck. Whether or not this is your primary purpose is not relevant, but it will be important and is important increasingly in terms of attracting external funding because funders expect to see a proper business plan, a proper business audit, and they ex expect to see economic change, social change, health and well-being change as a consequence of nature and heritage improvements. So one thing that needs to be done in a weak or undiversified economy is to grow the local supply chain, because that way you end up with multiple rounds of spending. You actually put more money back into the local economy. If you haven't got a local supply chain and if you don't employ local people, most of the money that is spent here goes straight out again. So we're encouraging local employment and local provision of services. 
And that, again, means better coordination and in some cases means effective training and support for those people who may wish to uh, enter employment in the various opportunities. Very importantly, we need to change perceptions of a region, improving the desire to reside and encouraging inward investment. So when you have uh, hugely pre prestigious developments like the lakeside in Doncaster, then and Pottery Car, the Greek game, gate, Green Gateway to Doncaster, then that actually changes people's perception of the area. It actually makes people think, mm, I, yeah, I wouldn't mind living there. I'd like to, to go there. It's a good place. I've read about it. I've heard about it. It's facilities. There's a nice environment. That increases the desire to reside and it brings in inward investment. It has a real time economic impact. So let's look at the crown jewels, if you like, the Humberhead Levels National Nature Reserve. It was, I mean, Thorn is still four by seven miles. It's a vast site for lowland. It has been stripped of peat. It was a huge multi-dome raised bog, one of the most precious nature conservation sites, ecological systems in Britain. And it's now a sad rump of what it was. It's still fantastic but it wasn't this vast flat landscape and the little bits of the edge of that great raised bog still existing in the landscape but i have to say from having seen them terribly dry so they're not sustainable as they are and we have problems you know this site needs to be growing sphagnum it needs to be re-wetted gradually from the desperate days of intensive drainage but you don't want to flood it, you want to make it wetter very gradually. These are the sphagnum, the, the bog builders. That one's papillos and that is a real peat former. But we have problems, we have the crown jewels, Thorn and Hatfield. They are not user friendly. They're not even for the the non-specialists, they're not particularly attractive. They are fantastic for nature, but most people going into them would feel quite intimidated. Great flat expanses of peat bog. I think it's fantastic, but most people I understand don't. And the access is dreadful for most parts of it. For Thorn itself, you go to the moor ends entrance, past the discarded sofas and armchairs and the dereliction across the derelict industrial site where the colliery was um, and eventually you get to the nature reserve and then you've got to find your way in so we have problems with that and there's no spend there's no there's no accommodation there's no, for a visitor there's almost nothing there and the perception is very negative this great peat bog so we need to tell that story more imaginatively. We need to actually engage with people, but we also need to provide something for them to uh, experience and to enjoy. It looks post-industrial. It looks derelict from the outside. And it's seated in a landscape of modern intensive farming, which again is not easy on the eye, and it's not easy on the water systems because you step outside the core nature reserve and you're suddenly into a landscape which is drains two, three, four, five meters down. The water table used to be above what is now ground level. And that landscape of desiccated peat is hemorrhaging carbon into the atmosphere. So we have some big, big problems in terms of sustainability, but we also have problems in terms of tourism. Step into Thorn, step into more ends and talk to ordinary people. These areas have multiple socioeconomic deprivations. And that is unacceptable. We have big problems there. And to what extent are they engaged in uh, and supported by and encouraged by the National Nature Reserves? And I would suggest not greatly.
and we have continuing environmental damage by peat extraction industry and I've talked to Evergreen Garden Care Limited and yes they are hoping to go peat free but they're not there yet so they're still extracting so that is damaging the environment and it's not only damaging the local landscape and the ecology but it's also hemorrhaging carbon into the atmosphere this is a sort of view that you see uh, on the edge of the nature reserves drains great drains cutting through what should be um, the raised bog it will take centuries to recover to anything like what it used to be and indeed it may be that the future uh, trajectory of this landscape will not be it won't go back to what it was it will go to something new something hopefully exciting something positive but at the moment we need to harness the drainage and actually re-wet the landscape this is a part of the site at uh, Hatfield where I actually proposed to Evergreen that we could do uh, a demonstration quite easily quite easily this is the old peat storage area it's now being cleared it has to be restored and we suggested that this could be a site where we could actually recreate a living raised mire and not only that we could document it uh, put it on the internet work with the media to show people how this wonderful landscape can recover and how nature given a chance will come back it looked very positive at one point it now looked far less positive and having had really undertakings from evergreen that this is what they wanted to do we've now had serious bounce back so we're still waiting to see what happens and in the meantime this land is hemorrhaging carbon dioxide this is a massive release of climate change gases greenhouse gases along with all the other problems of water and of course some of fire risk in a landscape which is desiccated so we still have huge huge problems and yet across the region we do have some beacons of good practice Yorkshire Wildlife Trust at Pottery Carr for example and th this gives you everything you want you've got fantastic nature reserve which is delivering again another term I don't like but ecosystem services uh, holding back floodwaters cleaning wastewaters and providing biodiversity mopping up carbon etc etc but also you've got what the visitor needs for a tourism economy you've got a car park you've got signage interpretation you've got rangers you've got a welcoming atmosphere you've got a cafe you've got loos you've got a shop what more could you ask you've got fantastic birds there so that's the sort of good practice that we want to encourage and we see as I, as I say, I described this back in the early 2000s as the Green Gateway to Doncaster. This was it's one of the biggest urban nature reserves in the entire country and therefore in the world. And we need to celebrate that and we need to make the most of it. So welcome to Pottery Car, Green Gateway to Doncaster. And there are other wildlife trust sites across the area, plus things like local museums, especially in Doncaster itself, community centres and various community-based projects, heritage sites such as Conisbrook, informal heritage such as churches, etc. We've got a wonderful network of rural parishes, particularly across the Doncaster district, and many of those are uh, very old settlements with medieval churches and absolutely glorious countryside. And a wonderful network of uh, greenways and footpaths and bridleways. And growing across the region over the years, outdoor sport and leisure facilities. They're doing very, very well. There's golfing, there's fishing, there's outdoor activity centres, etc. etc. So these things are all happening, but they're not really coordinated, they're not necessarily nested in approaches to improve the countryside and improve biodiversity that is still to come we are also faced by the cautionary tale of the disastrous earth center at Conisborough. and i had a student who was a volunteer there but also 
uh, he did a dissertation on the Earth Centre um, and the visitor profile for it. And it was disastrous. Um, it discriminated against car visits, which is understandable from an environmental point of view, but was a disaster from a commercial point of view. And the local community centre in the final period was getting more visitors, more day visitors than was the Earth Centre itself. And it was only part built when they were inviting visitors in and it looked like a building site. And they also they then actually put bulldozers through the one area of really nice wildflower meadows that I had previously pointed out to them. So the, the orchid meadows actually got flattened um, because they brought in a, a construction company that didn't know the site and weren't supervised. So that is a, a cautionary tale to think about. We have opportunities to develop massive synergies. Epworth is a centre of the Methodist Church and it has received on historic anniversaries hundreds of thousands of visitors from around the world. The question then is, what information do those people get? Were they encouraged to return? Were there opportunities to spend? Were they able to stop in the area? Did they discover other places to go, other places to visit? I suspect not. We have Conisborough just down the road in the great, I mean, the wonderful Don Valley Gorge. So this is a fantastic asset. Ivanhoe country, how evocative can you get? But are we making the most of it? No, we're not. It's not coordinated. I doubt if you go to one of the nature reserves, if you'll actually also see uh, leaflets and information on telling you to go to Conisborough or telling you to go to some of the other centers or heritage or nature assets around the region. We are not coordinated. We also have this fantastic landscape, which we've been discovering recently with communities in Fish Lake and Sycaps particularly, but it really applies to the wider area. This is the, the landscape of white willows, the great white willows. These are fantastic trees. They were part of the working landscape, probably several hundred years old in some cases. You can see how these are old pollard trees. If they're not repollarded, they will fall over, they will die. These are biodiverse rich. We don't know what's there. We know we get things like that's a stag beetle and things like that, but nobody's ever looked. We've got barn owls nesting in them. We've got wild honeybees. We'll have all sorts of other insects and lichens and fungi of separate silic uh, deadwood environments. We know almost nothing about them until very recently they've been totally unappreciated. And people in the farming community are still knocking these trees over. And actually that is illegal because these will be bat roofs. So if anybody watches this who is thinking about knocking a tree over, don't. It's a serious offence without actually checking it first. And all these old trees are almost certainly going to be uh, sites for roosting bats. But we don't appreciate them. We've already found the sixth largest white willow recorded in England. And that's just touching the surface. We know there's a resource just in Sycaus and Fish Lake of about 1,200 or more such fantastic trees. And this can be something that we can celebrate. Some of these go back, I think, from the archaeology, possibly go back to before the great drainage of the 1600s. So here we have an iconic species, an iconic landscape, and something that we need to celebrate as a platform for changing perceptions and for developing uh, awareness of what a wonderful landscape this is. Since I first started doing work on the Humber Levels, we have had some major tourism developments, although I have to say they're very difficult to get hold of to speak to. I wanted to get information on the Yorkshire Wildlife Park, but nobody seems to respond. Um, but it's been incredibly successful. It has good visitor numbers. It provides facilities and it provides contact with nature, albeit nature often rescued from difficult situations in captivity elsewhere around the world. But they've done a huge job, you know, they've done an important job and they get a, an amazing message out to people. And one of the things again, is that you provide what people want. So you are 
taking customers through the gateway. So you've got money coming in. You've then got shops, cafes, restaurants, visitor facilities, and hopefully you can nest that into local supply chains through local farmers and through local businesses. And you should be training up people to work there through the local colleges and the other networks. So what we're looking at there is a win-win situation. But again, when I've been there, I didn't see information that told me about the other wonderful places to visit in and around that area. So we're not making the most, it's not coordinated, it's not marketed. Because what you're looking to do as a tourism um, operator or as a tourism promoter is to get your day visits, get the local visits, then get the overnighters, then turn those to weekenders, then turn those to week-long stays and to get return visits. Now, it may not be visits to your site. And this is a, this is a dilemma for um, tourism operators that they tend to think, well, why should I put something into the pot to promote visits to the whole region? Because I will just be encouraging people to go to my um, competitors. Whereas what we need to see is people think, oh, OK, if people go from the wildlife park to Potrick, that's good. They enjoy it. They may come back. You know, they'll actually develop the experience. They'll tell other people to come. So do it that way. Let's coordinate better. We have some terrible challenges. This is the middle of Thorn. And my God, you know, would you want to go and have a holiday there? And Thorn, I'm sure, was a very nice little market town before being discovered by Deep Mine Coal. It was then very wealthy in many ways. A lot of people employed, although obviously on mining wages. Um, and then the coal mining ends and just abandons the area. So, you know, you've got a derelict town. I mean, that is a terrible, terrible negative image in terms of anybody visiting or driving through. Even if you weren't stopping in Thorn itself, if you drive through that, you think, hmm, this is not where I want to spend my holidays. Now, to change that requires careful planning. It requires big investment. But we have no choice. We have to do it. The consequence is that the facilities that you've got close down. They're not viable. They're not sustainable. And as each of them closes down, you're losing an opportunity to spend. Open to first floor. Um, yeah, that's probably experiencing the environment very, very much face to face. There's no glazing. And it's situated in this sort of very bland, intensive farming landscape. And again, that's hemorrhaging carbon to the atmosphere. It's shedding water um, into the drains, causing flooding. There's no biodiversity in there to speak of. There might be a few lapwing if they can last long enough to breed before it's ploughed over again. But it's not a long-term sustainable landscape. The soil is disappearing into the atmosphere, the land is subsiding, and the waters, uh, the groundwater is often going down, but the flood water is rising. So it's not good. And it doesn't look good either. We could do this a lot better. A lot of this, as I say, is to do with histories, the great drainage of the 1600s. This was part of it before that. This is on the outskirts uh, to the south of Thorn Moors, the great peat bog. And here in 1609, we have the Royal Hunting Party in 100 boats pursuing 500 deer across Thorn Mere. Within a few years, the whole landscape had gone. But deer had once been as common as sheep upon the hills and so unruly that they almost ruined the country because they were the king's deer and the local peasantry couldn't control them. And then it disappears. This is a lake that we've never seen, we will never see. Whittlesea Mere down in Cambridgeshire uh, survived to the mid 1800s, so we have eyewitness accounts. We have engravings of it. Thormere disappears before then. There's writing about it and there is this painting but nobody seems to know whether this was at the time or painted uh, retrospectively. 
Patrick Carr is seeking to reinstate some of the great wetland. It was the biggest of the peripheral fens and cars around the outside of the great uh, Humber head fenlands and bogs. But it's cheap by jowl to major infrastructure. So yes, it's great, but we also need to offset much, much more to make any impact on what that infrastructure and the associated business enterprises are doing. And my personal feeling is that the business are not contributing as they might. This was from the Business Doncaster website a few years ago. And I don't see the solar panels. I don't see the green roofs. I don't see the water harvesting. I don't see the biodiversity compensation. I don't see the mechanisms for engaging the workforce in the environment, in climate mitigation and all these things. I don't see any wind generation. You know, why not? Why is that not a vast solar battery, a vast wind battery? Why is it not a biodiversity hub? It could be. It could be if we wanted it. We don't do it. So what are those businesses contributing to the greener Humber head levels? What are they contributing to mopping up carbon? to holding back flood water, to recovering biodiversity. I don't see the bug boxes, the bat boxes, the bird boxes, the feeders, the ponds. Why not? I suspect if you asked the workers there, they would welcome all that. And for a business, it would be small change. So questions, questions, questions. And that is itself as it is now at the moment, it's not even green, it's not attractive to look at. That is a big negative in terms of tourism development. If you've got dirty washing and it's hanging out in a flatland, you see it from a long way around. Why are we not creating wildflower meadows along all those arterial roads, along all the roadside reservations, the central reservations, the verges? Why do we not do what the Dutch do along some of their main roads? We could do it better. We choose not to. So some challenges. We have a vision, a cunning plan in the words of Bolrick. I came up with the idea of a great northern fen, which harks back to my historic work on the drainage of this former uh, great wetland, one of the three great wetlands in England, Somerset Levels, the Cambridge and East Anglian Fens, and the Yorkshire and Lincolnshire Fen. So why not? We could even have a UNESCO Biosphere Reserve, which myself and my colleague Professor Peter Bridgewater have suggested, and that could link into uh, the idea of the nature and the biosphere reserve, which can have different zonation. It can include urban areas and peripheral areas uh, around a core zone. So we've got it with the, the jewels in the crown of the National Nature Reserves, and it could include everything else. And it could even have a focus on health and well-being in relation to contact with nature. So why not do that? We've got the great white willows, a symbolic of a historic past and a greener future local countryside recreation and an emerging tourism economy often linked to the new housing and residential uh, demographics around this vast landscape. We need to do it. We need to do it for people's health and well-being. We need to do it for climate mitigation and resilience. And we need to do it for the economy. So why are we not doing it? Don't future generations deserve this? Health and well-being could be major drivers for this sort of landscape. So I would identify a, a key role for Doncaster University College, for example. Some simple things could be done, improvements to signage and landscape quality along the M18 and A1 corridors and around the emerging commercial business sectors. And think about the Dutch model, for example. So just to finish with some final thoughts, there is an elephant in the room. 
And it's an argument that I lost profoundly when I was doing work in the 1990s and 2000s. But I argue that in terms of developing a leisure and tourism economy across this region, which has fantastic natural and heritage assets, you need a tourism hub, what we call an economic growth pole. And from that, people will come and businesses and investment will spin off. And we've got things like pottery slightly to the periphery of the main area. So pottery was always, it was the biggest of the cars around the edge of the wetland. It's not the centre of the wetland. The centre of the wetland is Thorn and Hadfield. And we do not have a visitor centre that will do this. I argued strongly that around Moor Ends and Thorn, for example, there need to be something that engaged local people, that provided training, that showed that they their future employment, their economic well-being might benefit from being next to this vast wetland. That argument fell on deaf ears. Now, it doesn't mean, for example, that you have to have um, lots of visitors to sensitive sites. Ground Thorn, it is surrounded by farmland, which is not long-term viable and which is draining the core sites and contributing to climate change, diminishing resilience, diminishing biodiversity and causing flooding. Now, some of those areas or maybe one relatively modest area could be converted to a nature reserve, a little bit like RSPB Old Moor in the Durham Valley. That would get the visitors because what the birders want are rare birds and spectaculars. We'll talk about that later as well. And what the people want are uh, either good transport to the site or car parking, toilets, shops, visitor centre, wardens, rangers, signage, information, shops, cafes, etc. And they want to be able to see something. Now you can talk to them and give them video and clips of, and live footage of the nature reserve from key places so they can see the wonderful birds of prey and such things on thorn moors and wonderful dragonflies. But most people wouldn't want to go into it. They want an easy experience. So you could do all that adjacent to the main nature reserve. Why do we not have a, a peat steam railway or a diesel railway in the case of Thorne, actually taking people into the site in a relatively easy, environmentally friendly way? Again, it doesn't need to go into the core area. It could go into habitat created areas around it. People will come to uh, steam tourism attractions and railway tourism attractions. Wouldn't it be great to be able to experience some of the uh, wildlife of the peat bog whilst going almost silently on a barge along a canal? Why are we not doing it? It's the elephant in the room. Because the nature reserve brings very little actual benefit to most of the people in that area. And that is a sad fact about it. And we need to do better. It's inexcusable, in my opinion. So these were things that we recommended uh, at the end of valuing wetness. And RSPB shows what can be done uh, at Old Mall. It shows what can be done in some really the most unlikely circumstances. This was the most, one of the most impoverished and derelict landscapes in the whole of Western Europe, and it's now a thriving tourism hub. So well done RSPB, well done Yorkshire Wildlife Trust of Pottrick, but we need to do better. There is one um, reason for a lot of this, which I'll just finish with, um, with my historic hat on, interested in the great drainage, when I realized how much wetland there had been, and the fact that this has mostly been drained, I want to know who, why, what, where, and when, uh, what had happened. And it, it's really about the 1600s that is a tipping point. And some of it then resonates down to tourism right to this very day, because people just perceived these, people outside the Great Fenlands, perceived them as frightening malarial wetlands of neither use to man nor beast. And the people that inhabited them, they viewed as dwarfish because they've got the marsh ague, dwarfish, jaundiced, uh, strange people that spoke an odd dialect. 
And William Gilpin, who was a pioneer of the picturesque landscape movement, summed this up from his visit to the Fens in 1769. And this is a man who kickstarted tourism to Snowdonia, to Cornwall, to Cumbria, to the Peak District, these great hubs of tourism activity. And he went to the Fens and he was not impressed. He said, it is such a country as a man would wish to see once for curiosity, but would never desire to visit a second time. One view sufficiently imprints the idea. Indeed, where there is but one idea, there can arise no confusion in the recollection. And that in the late 1700s, early 1800s, basically consigned visiting the Fenland landscapes to the dustbin in terms of tourism for nearly 200 years. And it was then the Wildlife Trust, the National Trust and the RSPB that turned that situation around. But that has had a long-term impact on the corporate psyche when it comes to these landscapes, combined with um, their drainage, their conversion to intensive arable lands and bland, bland, bland. Thank you for listening. There's more on the websites, Twitter and blog.